As we look at God's Word this evening, we want to make sure you have a a copy of God's Word in your hand. And so uh, we have some gentlemen here who are going to hand out Bibles uh, for you. If you need one, uh, if you could just raise your hand, we'd love to get one for you. So if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand and open up your Bible to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. This weekend, I've had the enormous privilege of getting to speak at our women's conference, our women's retreat, and it it was just so sweet to get to be among the Women of Grace Bible Church and to get to open God's Word uh, with you and uh, been just really blessed by that opportunity and encouraged by the spiritual maturity of the women in this church. It, it, was, it was really precious being together and getting to look at God's word. And over the course of the weekend, we've really fixed our attention to what God's word has to say in regards to prayer. The, the theme was drawing near to the throne of grace and drawing near to the throne of grace, particular, particularly as it relates to drawing near to the God of grace in prayer. And we started our, our time together this weekend looking at prayer and the sovereignty of God. And we saw from Daniel chapter 9, we saw a man who understood the sovereignty of God. He knew God was all powerful. He knew he had plans and purposes and His knowledge, his understanding that actually drove him to intercession, to prayer, to petition on behalf of God's people. And next we looked at Matthew 6 and we saw prayer and the instruction of Christ and Christ's roadmap, his his guidelines for what the, the whole of the Christian prayer life should look like, the kinds of things we should pray, the heart in our prayer, and that is predominantly the glory of God and the need of man. And the need of man as it pertains to seeking the end of bringing glory to God. And then last night we looked at Psalm 42 and we discussed prayer in the distraught soul. The role that prayer can play in the heart of the believer as we're experiencing various trials, difficulties. And then this morning we looked at common questions and misconceptions of prayer. And what I want to do tonight is wrap up kind of the whole of our time Uh, looking at God's word in regards to prayer for the women, and then for you as well, you get to jump in at the end, and we're going to look at prayer in the body of Christ. How do we pray well for one another? What should our petitions before the Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, be for each other in this church? How how should we pray for those who are most dear to us, who we love most sincerely, who we pour ourselves out for, who we worship with every week, who we fellowship with throughout the week? So that's what we're going to look at this evening. And in the book, A Call to Spiritual Reformation, D.A. Carson writes of a young woman by the name of Florence Chadwick, and he states that in 1952, she stepped off of the beach... At Catalina Island and into the water, determined to swim to the shore of mainland California. And she was already an experienced long-distance swimmer. She was the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. But on this day, the weather was foggy and chilly on the day that she had set out. She could scarcely see the boats that would accompany her. And for 15 hours, she swam. 15 hours. She begged to be taken out, but her trainer urged persistence, telling her again and again that she could make it, that the shore was not far away, physically and emotionally exhausted. Finally, she just stopped swimming, and she was pulled out. The boats made for shore, and she discovered it was a mere half mile away. To her, apparently, that wasn't much. To me, I wouldn't even go for a half mile. (laughs) The next day, she gave a news conference, and what she said, in effect, was this, I do not want to make excuses for myself. I am the one who asked to be pulled out, but I think that if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. 
Carson goes on to write that two months later, she proved her point. On a bright and clear day, she plunged back into the sea and she swam the distance. When Florence couldn't see, she grew weary, she lost hope, she gave up. Yet when that vision was ever before her, she endured. And I want to ask you this evening, what is your vision for prayer? What do you keep before you in regards to prayer? We need, we must have a clear, a thought out, a biblically informed vision for our prayers that understands rightly who God is and that understands rightly what God has done in his son and who we are and what we need and what he has provided. We need to have an intentional vision ever set before us so that we might press on, so that we might persevere, so that we might endure, so that we might faithfully seek the Lord and petition the Lord and pursue the Lord in worship and in prayer that is pleasing and honoring to Him. What is your prayer life like? And What is your prayer life like, particularly as it relates to your prayers for one another? Christians frequently pray for themselves and for others whom they love, somewhat vain things, temporal things, shallow things, misguided things, short-sighted things, at times selfish things. Pray for promotions, wealth, success, personal benefit, comfort, solutions to fix the problems problems of this life. Pray for the cars that we drive. Pray for a husband. Pray for a wife. And while all of these things are not bad, not all of these things are bad, they're very low on Jesus' priority list. And then they're, they're very low on Paul's priority list. The kind of prayers that we see exemplified in Scripture don't typically include those types of things. And it's not that any of those things in and of themselves are sinful to pray for, but I'm sure with wrong motives, any one of us would be capable of praying for those things in a way that is displeasing to the Lord. But Paul, however, here in our passage this evening has a very different vision for prayer. He has a very different priority in regards to his prayer, which he offers up on behalf of the Thessalonians. He has a very different priority in regards to the things that are on his heart, that are on his mind, to petition the sovereign God of the universe for. So again, what do you pray for? What do you pray for in regards to the people you love? What do you pray for in regards to the people in your small group? What kind of prayers do you offer up for the people with whom you co-labor for the sake of the gospel with? What kind of prayers do you offer up on behalf of this church? If God suddenly appeared in our midst and told you that he would grant to you three requests for Grace Bible Church right now. What would you ask for? And I know what you're thinking. That the coffee ministry would serve coffee past 945. Paul is praying for the right kinds of things. Paul is praying for the things that are honoring and pleasing to the Lord. And so let's Let's fix our attention to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 this evening. Read with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 11. Paul gives a report of his prayer for the Thessalonians, and he says, To this end also we pray for you always, that our God will count you worthy of your calling. And fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. 
so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be appropriate for us to go to the Lord now in prayer. God, thank you for the richness of your word. Thank you for Paul's report of the things that he prays, how he prays, why he prays for the Thessalonians. And I pray that this evening that you would help inform our hearts and our minds so that we might pray well, so that we might petition well so that we might seek you for that which is pleasing to you. We need your help, we need your spirit, we need his help so that we might understand, so that we might apply well these truths and we ask so that you would be glorified in us and through us. That you would be seen within our hearts and in the outpouring of our lives as the great God that you are. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Paul reports of three components pertaining to his prayer for the Thessalonians. Paul here reports of three components pertaining to his prayer for the Thessalonians. Paul is giving to the Thessalonians a report of what he is praying, how he's praying, why he's praying for them. We're going to see three elements or three parts of this prayer this evening that Paul is offering up to God. So first, the first component Paul reports on is the practice of his prayer. The practice. We see that first thing in verse 11. And I would like to consider Paul's practice of prayer. Paul had a desire for the Thessalonians. He wanted to see some things in their lives. He desired various things for them. And he did not turn to his ingenuity his creativity, his strategies to see it accomplished in his friends. He didn't turn to some program. No, he turned to God. He turned to God in prayer. And this was Paul's practice to bring his request to God faithfully, diligently. You see there in the beginning of verse 11, to this end also we pray for you always. And there is a lot packed into this phrase. Much is revealed about Paul's practice in this phrase. First, he's praying for the Thessalonians, and he is praying for them always, which this practice was normal for Paul. That kind of consistency, that kind of regular practice of prayer is consistent for Paul. His prayer was intentional purposeful, focused. It wasn't generic or abstract. It was specific. Paul has a goal in mind. To this end, I pray. And he prays for worthiness, for fulfillment, and for power or effective service. And we'll talk more about those things shortly, about his petitions in a moment. But Paul is praying with intention, with purpose. And it's not that he needs great length in order to do this, but rather the depth of his prayers are so rich, they're so full. And many people can pray long, drawn out, even impressive prayers, and yet be speaking speaking in total generalities that never really get to a point. Well, Paul gets to the point. He prays specifically, he prays intentionally, he prays consistently. Paul petitions God for the maturity of the Thessalonians because he knew with with full conviction that his friends' growth as Christians, their sanctification and their growth in holiness, just like their salvation, would only come through God's sovereign grace and empowering strength in their lives. The Thessalonians were obligated and instructed as all Christians to pursue vigorously growth and obedience to Christ. Our pursuit of holiness is not passive on our parts. We seek to be obedient to Christ wholeheartedly. We throw ourselves at holiness faithfully. faithfully. And when it happens, we know We know it wasn't something in us that conjured that up. It is the the strength, the power of God working inside of us. In 
We see this reality all throughout Paul's writings. Specific commands, exhortations, and grace. Specific instruction and grace. They're not conflicting with one another. God uses them in his sovereign purpose to grow us, to transform us, to conform us more into the image of his son. God's sovereign work, prayer, and obedience are all necessary elements to growth in the Lord. We spoke a lot this weekend about how God's sovereign power doesn't negate the need for prayer, but it calls for it. God, in his sovereignty and infinite wisdom, has woven the prayer of his people and the answering of those prayers specifically into the expression and outworking of his sovereignty. And as we've discussed this weekend with the women, James 5 is clear that prayer matters. In verse 16, James says, The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And his example in verse 17 is Elijah being a man with a nature like ours. And he goes on to say he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. God is clearly all-powerful. He clearly has a plan, and part of his means for accomplishing his plans is that his people would pray, and Paul knew this very well. To this end, we pray always. There wasn't any complacency in Paul's heart or mind in regards to praying on behalf of the Thessalonians. He's persistent in his prayer for his fellow believers. They are daily on his mind, daily on his heart. And this really should be the heart of a pastor, of a shepherd. The duties of a faithful shepherd, of a faithful elder or preacher, a pastor, do not end with the end of his sermon. But care for the flock is a daily task as it relates to prayer, and it is a sweet task indeed to get to intercede on behalf of those whom we love so dearly, on behalf of those whom God has entrusted under our care. What a a privilege. We need to be praying pastors, elders of Grace Bible Church. We need to pray for the people that God has entrusted under our care. What a privilege that we get to do so. And as people of Christ, we need to pray faithfully for each other. This should be the heart of the people of God to offer up prayers diligently on behalf of each other. What an act of love. What a, what a purifying means of the motives for which we show love to each other. Right, It can be easy at times, and, and, and there can be ill motives at times, selfish motives in showing kindness to each other publicly. We should cultivate hearts that in, in the quiet of our homes, when no one else is around, we show love to one another through faithful, intentional, consistent, Biblically founded prayer for each other. And Paul did this always. Paul reports of three components pertaining to his prayer for the Thessalonians. The first report we see concerning Paul's prayer is the practice of his prayer. He does it. He does it intentionally. He does it persistently. And next we see his petitions. This is the next report that he gives concerning his prayer, his petitions, and there are three of them here. We see them in the second half of verse 11, and it's for worthiness, fulfillment, and power. This is the substance of Paul's prayer. This is what what he is requesting for the Thessalonians. And the first petition is that God, look at verse 11, may count you worthy of his calling. 
Now look just a a few verses before verse 11. In verse 5, the the thought there was of the readers being considered worthy to enter into the kingdom. That's the eschatological kingdom. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. Here in verse 11, the prayer is that God may deem them worthy of the calling This is the calling they have received from God. This is the divine call that resulted in their conversion. We see this call in Romans 8.30. It says, In these whom he predestined, he also called. In these whom he called, he also justified. In these whom he justified, he also glorified. Just to be clear, this calling isn't merely an invitation But it is an effective call in Paul's writings. This call is always answered. Those who are called by God are those who are saved by God. Paul encouraged or employs the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 1, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, they have been called into the body of Christ, into the household of God. They have been, by God's grace, transformed from darkness into light. And Paul is praying for them that God would count them worthy of this calling that he has affected. They they cannot make themselves worthy by their own efforts. And yet at the same time, they need to diligently and earnestly seek to live in such a way that God would count them worthy of his calling. These believers, what Paul is praying is that they must grow in all the things that please God so that he is pleased with them, not on the basis of, of granting to them salvation, but as the intended purpose for salvation. Do you understand that? He's not praying that they would merit the calling, but they would live out God's intended purpose of the calling. He's praying that they'd be faithful, that they'd be mature, that they'd be conformed into the image of Christ. That they would be obedient, that they would be holy. By God's free, unmerited grace, we have been justified before him. We have been given eternal life, and not one of us at that time when God saved us was worthy of that gift. Not one is worthy of that tremendous gift from God, that precious, precious, unmerited kindness poured out from God to us through the death of his own son. None of us was worthy of that gift, but now Paul wants believers to become what they were not. And he prays to that end. He prays that Christians might live in such a way that they would be worthy of what it means to be a Christian. Christian, you were bought with a price. And it would be unfitting if you were purchased by the blood of Jesus and you looked just like those who reject him. Wouldn't that be tragic? If if you confess to faith in Christ, but your life looked just like those who hate him, who suppress the truth about him and their unrighteousness, it can't be. We need to walk in a manner that is consistent with God's saving grace in our lives. And we need God to help us. Paul knew that. That's why he was praying this for the Thessalonians always. Praise that Christians might live in such a way that they would please God. They would honor God. We cannot become this left to our own devices. 
And this is why Paul prays. He's not simply asking the Thessalonians to try harder. He's instructing them. He is instructing them. There's specific instruction in this book. And at the same time, he's petitioning God always on their behalf to this end. When was the last time you prayed this kind of prayer for this church? God. Father. You have lavished upon us such a grace, a transforming grace. Would you help us? Would you help us walk? Would you help us walk in a manner that's worthy of such unmerited grace? We aren't worthy of it in and of ourselves, and we need you to help us be pleasing to you. When you think about what you pray for yourself, when you think about what you pray for your family, and, and when you think about what you pray for this church, it would be good to consider in that prayer how your values, how your requests, how your petitions to God will appear to you 30 years from now. What will you think 30 years from now about the petitions that you are making to God for this church today? Better yet, what will you think 30 billion years from now when you are in the presence of God about the petitions that you are making for this church today? Pray biblical prayers. Pray God-honoring prayers. Pray prayers that when answered by God, bear weight into eternity for the glory of God. That's the kind of prayers that we need to pray. Paul starts with the petition that they would be worthy of the calling. Paul's second petition is where he says, and fulfill every desire for goodness. Paul prays that God, by his power, would bring into fruition each Christian's good, faith-prompted purposes. Paul prays that God would empower the Thessalonians to live out the new Christ-centered purposes that he has given to them in their salvation. In their regeneration. And this is mind-blowing. Paul understands that God's people have been so transformed through their salvation, so transformed by the gospel, that they now have a whole new set of goals and desires. And these desires are now shaped by God to be what is good and right and pleasing to the Lord. We now, in Christ, purpose to be holy and to be pleasing to the Lord. It's a new ambition that God has given to us in our salvation, in our regeneration, for that which is good and right and pleasing to him. And Paul prays that these desires that we now have, that his desire for the Thessalonians is that these desires that they now have for good, that God would fulfill in them every one. That God himself may take these purposes and desires for what is good and so work to bring them to fulfillment, to fruition in their lives. And we need God for this. We're desperate for God's help in this. Uh, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. And unless the Lord fulfills our good faith prompted purposes, they will not progress. They will be but empty dreams come and gone or vain morality. We need his spirit empowered work in our life producing the fruit of the spirit so that we might honor him, so that we might please him. 
so that every good desire that he's given to us might come to pass in our lives. And for Paul, nothing less than divine power working for God's glory will satisfy him. That's what he wants. Their own efforts apart from God and his power, it will not do. Paul prays that they would do the work of faith. That they would fulfill the work of faith with power. And that that would happen as they live out God's work faithfully, intentionally, and dependently. And in this prayer, Paul is covering both their inner desire and their outward action. Both must be wrought in God. God counts men worthy as they are faithful to do that which he works in them. And Paul, in this, is praying that every good work prompted by your faith would be lived out in your life. And this outward working of inner faith is an outward expression of living faith. And that's what we should all earnestly desire. The last petition Paul presents is for power. He says, and the work of faith with power. Nothing less than divine power working in them for God's glory will satisfy Paul. Their own efforts apart from God, it simply will not do. And Paul prays that they would do the work of faith, that they would fulfill the work of faith, and that they would do it with power. Only God's power can enable a God-glorifying end. Paul understood this. Only God's power, his divine power, can enable a God-glorifying end. And this brings incredible hope because he has granted to us in his divine power all things pertaining to life and godliness. And it brings about a humbling effect because we know we, the only opportunity we have, the only chance that we have of being pleasing to God is in his strength, not our own. That's a beautiful reality when it comes to the glory of God, for one who desires above all else the glory of God. That is precious. That is good. Paul wanted the Thessalonians' work of faith to be done in power so that there would be faithful, righteous deeds that would abound in their lives and ones that were pleasing to God. And I, I think this is the same idea as Peter when he sets forth in 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. He says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of Utterances of God, whoever serves, is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. When we serve in a way that is honoring to God, it must be done by the power of God. Now, why is Paul praying these things? He's praying always to this end. He's praying faithfully, intentionally. Why is he praying these things? Why is Paul burdened by these requests? And that's our last report that we see from Paul, and that's in verse 12, the purpose. Why is he presenting these kinds of petitions, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The goal of Paul's prayer, the purpose of Paul's prayer, why he prayed, what drove him was so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ 
may be glorified in them and them in him. Paul has a two-part goal for his prayers he is offering up. And it's because he's seeking the glorification of the Lord Jesus and it is because he is seeking the glorification of believers. Now wait just a moment, Paul. Ah, Prayer is about the glory of God, not my glory. Right? I thought thought prayer was, was about the glory of God and now you're saying prayer is about my glory as well? Well, I'm not saying it. Paul said it. So what does it mean? Paul, no doubt, no doubt is, is, is mistaken here. He, he hasn't gone off the deep end. He knows God's jealousy for his own glory. He's well aware of Isaiah 42.8 where it says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. There is another glory here than the Lord's glory Paul is desiring. He is desiring the one day when these believers will be made perfect. The one day when they will enjoy resurrected bodies of the same order as Jesus' resurrected body. He's longing for the day and praying for the day when these believers will see Jesus in all of his splendor unveiled and will be like him. That is the glory he's desiring for the believers here. There's a, there's a difference in the glory that Paul is setting forth. When we give God glory, we're not giving him something he doesn't possess. We are simply ascribing to him what is true about him. But with us, when we are glorified, we're receiving something we are not. We're receiving something we don't possess on our own. We are being made more like Jesus. We're being strengthened to put on display something we in and of ourselves don't possess. And Paul is praying for this because our glory that we will experience on that day can only be and will only be attributed to God's glory. For selfish Godless, helpless, lawless, rebellious sinners to become children of God and to then increasingly reflect his greatness and to one day in fullness be perfected in sinlessness, able to enjoy God sinlessly forever could only be the fruit and the outworking of a holy, marvelous, perfect, and majestic God. And in that moment where we are glorified, Christ is glorified as he receives the praise that is due his name for his great work. On the last day, Jesus will be glorified in us on account of what we have become because of his great sacrifice and his great grace and his great love. And in this reason for his request, Paul has the final end in mind, but not at the exclusion of the now. Paul wants Christians to be glorified not only at the end, which is in line with God's promises of what he will do for the believer, but he wants that now for them as we prepare for the end and we are progressively sanctified. We're progressively transformed from glory to glory. in anticipation of all that will be. And this is the twofold purpose of Paul's prayer, that God would be glorified in us and that we would be glorified in him, that we would be conformed to Christ's likeness more and more and more. Now that is a prayer that is worth praying daily, always. That is a good prayer. Paul is consumed by that kind of prayer. Praise it always for God to be glorified and for his fellow saints to be sanctified into the likeness of Christ. 
Paul ends his report of his prayer for the Thessalonians saying, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these requests and reasons are founded in the grace of God. Everything in the Christian life that is good is founded in the grace of God. Prayer and godly living for God's glory must be inseparable. John Owen once wrote, He who prays as he ought will endeavor to live as he prays. At the heart of our prayers for one another must be a biblical vision. One that desires earnestly to embrace God as he is, to rejoice in what he has done. And we must understand that we, what we are apart from Christ and who we are now in Christ and who, will be, who we will become because of Christ as we are conformed increasingly into his image for his glory. We need to pray prayers with diligence like this, with desires such as these, for the ultimate purpose of God's glory. Let every person who is a part of Grace Bible Church fulfill their good resolves by the power of God so that the name of our Lord will be glorified. God gives the power, God gets the glory through Jesus Christ. And our great longing is to see the Lord Jesus glorified in the world. And therefore, we will seek the power of God to fulfill the good resolves which he has given us. Let's pray like this for each other. Let's be faithful in our intercession on behalf of one another. Let's extend love to one another in this manner that Christ would be glorified in us and through, the, through us. And isn't it such wonderful news that we get to concern ourselves with things such as this? God's glory. What a privilege. Let's steward that privilege well. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your great grace that has granted to us salvation, a new life, a new purpose for that which is pleasing to you. Thank you that where sin once reigned in us, now grace reigns and we can live with a purpose outside of ourselves for the, the glory of your name. We can live empowered by one outside of ourselves. We can live in the strength with which you provide. We want you to work in us so that you would exalt yourself. We want, we plead with you to help us want more and help us live in light of those desires to be holy, set apart, pleasing to you. We pray, we plead that you would give us wisdom how to navigate this sinful, fallen world in holiness and love. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.